my name is Darcy and I'm based in Toronto, Canada. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in biology from Queen's University. And then I went on to complete a master's of science in environmental resource management from University College Dublin in Dublin, Ireland. With my thesis focusing on the effect of forestry mediated acidification on benthic macroinvertebrates. In simpler terms, I was looking at how commercial forestry impacts freshwater systems by examining the insect communities that are found within. After I completed my master's, I went on to work um, as an environmental technician doing field work for the Nature Conservancy of Canada, as well as the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority. These positions brought me to where I am now, where I'm working for Tree of Life, one of Canada's top distributors of natural and organic food, where I'm helping to develop and implement a national sustainability strategy while being a part of the customer development team. Now let's move on to the topic of today's presentation, carbon dioxide or CO2. The measurement and tracking of CO2 emissions began in the late 1950s when Charles David Keeling began measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide from Hawaii's Mauna Loa Observatory. He generated the famous Keeling curve, which you're gonna see on the right-hand side of your screen here. This demonstrated that CO2 levels in the atmosphere are increasing year over year and he was able to attribute this to the use of fossil fuels. It is important to note that Charles Keeling was not the first person to propose this correlation or the idea of what we now know as greenhouse gases or the greenhouse effect. In the early 1820s, French mathematician and physicist Joseph Fourier showed that the earth should actually be much cooler than it is given the amount of energy that it receives from the sun. He proposed that the Earth's atmosphere might be providing an insulating effect, retaining some of the heat that would otherwise be re-emitted into space. Over the next 100 years or so, scientists were debating the connection between the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere and the Earth's temperature. However, they lacked the data necessary to validate any of these claims. Keeling's data solidified this idea that increased CO2 emissions released by fossil fuel combustion lead to an increased global temperature due to the greenhouse effect. It should be noted that the greenhouse effect is actually a natural process that warms the Earth's surface and allows us as a human species to be able to live here. However, increasing concentration of greenhouse gases such as CO2 are causing the process to trap extra heat in the atmosphere. Climate change, um, the, sorry, the increased temperatures we are experiencing is known as global warming, which is just one of the many aspects of what we know as climate change. Climate change in general is the increasing changes in the measurements of climate over a long period of time. This includes precipitation patterns, temperature, and wind patterns. I may use the term global warming and climate change interchangeably in this presentation, but I just wanted you to know that there is a difference between the two. Now to add some context on, context on the movement of carbon in the atmosphere. This diagram depicts the carbon cycle, which refers to the movement of carbon driven by natural processes, which can be physical, uh, biological, or chemical. Annually, photosynthesis and ocean dissolution remove about 25% of CO2 from the atmosphere, which is equivalent to about 200 billion tons of carbon. Soils store about 2,000 petagrams of carbon, which is four times the amount of carbon as plant biomass and more than twice the amount that is held in the atmosphere. The issue with increasing carbon in the atmosphere is not only are we outputting more carbon into the atmosphere than the cycle can remove, but, but we are removing some of these carbon sinks as we call them through deforestation, thinning soils and increased ocean temperatures. So we're going to just discuss how these rising CO2 levels and increasing temperatures have been addressed globally. Since Keeling's findings, there has been an increased global effort to curb the rising atmospheric CO2 levels. In 1992, the Rio Earth Summit was held to address various environment related issues, such as the production of toxic components, including lead and gasoline, alternative sources of energy to replace fossil fuels, and a new focus on public transportation in order to reduce vehicle emissions and the growing usage and limited supply of water. 
But what is most important about this summit, however, is the agreement on the Climate Change Convention, which in turn led to the Kyoto Protocol and eventually the well-known Paris Agreement. Now, I'm not gonna to touch too much on the predecessors to the Paris Agreement due to some time constraints and given the relevance of the Paris Agreement today. The Paris Agreement is a legally binding international treaty on climate change, which entered into force on November 4th, 2015. The goal is to limit global warming by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a landmark agreement because for the first time, a binding agreement brings all nations into a common cause to undertake this ambitious effort to combat climate change. We're gonna to briefly touch on the CO2 trends um, and emissions specific to Switzerland. For some context, globally, the world adds about 51 billion tons of carbon um, of to the atmosphere every year. Swiss CO2 levels have actually decreased between 2000 and 2019, dropping from 43.1 million metric tons of CO2 emitted in 2000 to 38.2 million metric tons of CO2 emitted in 2019. This is equivalent to roughly 4.73 tons per person, which as you can see from the above the graph that you'll see on your screen now, fares pretty well compared to countries such as Netherlands, France, Canada, and Germany. Now in Switzerland, some of the biggest contributors to CO2 output are buildings, transport, industry, and agriculture. However, over time, the bulk of emissions where they used to come from the building sector now come from transportation. Agriculture in Switzerland has also seen a decrease in CO2 emissions. And this is largely because there has been a decline in total land use for agriculture, as well as the number of cattle being raised. The decline in animal herds and the use of mineral fertilizers brought down emissions from agriculture production by about 8% between 1990 and 2011, which is a fairly impressive number. And now that you kind of have a little bit of a background and understanding as to how CO2 can influence climate change and the factors that drive CO2 emissions, I'd just like to move on to how increasing CO2 impacts wildlife. Now, before I move on, when I'm talking about how CO2 impacts wildlife, I'm really referring to climate change, to global warming, both of which are exacerbated by increased CO2 in the atmosphere. One of the most prevalent examples of species population decline are polar bears. For first, I would like to point out that one reason why polar bears are so vulnerable to climate change is due to the fact that they are endemic, meaning that they are they inhabit a very specific geographical niche and they are unable to move or migrate to another habitat. And many of the species that I will be discussing today are endemic. Polar bears range across the Arctic Ocean in parts of Canada, Alaska, Russia, Greenland, and Norway. They walk or swim very long distances to find food. Their primary food source are seals. Polar bears rely on sea ice not only to access seals, however, also to rest and to breed. With less sea ice developing every year due to increasing global temperatures, polar bear populations are at risk. The Arctic is warming at a rate that's about twice as fast as the global average, and Arctic sea ice has been declining at a rate of about 12% per decade since monitoring began in the late 1970s. And you might be wondering why the Arctic is warming at this quicker rate, and it's due to a positive feedback loop. As temperatures rise, more ice melts, and more heat is absorbed into the Earth's surface. Less heat is reflected back, leading to more melting, which leads to more heat being absorbed, which leads to more melting. And this is the positive feedback loop that is feeding that accelerated warming that we are seeing in the Arctic. Now, as you can see here, global polar bear numbers are projected to decline 30% by 2050 due to this lack of food and lack of ice that they're experiencing. Now, climate change won't just impact um, mammals, reptiles, birds, insects, but it's gonna have a really big impact on plant life. With climate change comes more extreme temperatures, decreased water availability in certain regions and changes in soil conditions. As noted here, 571 species of plants have gone extinct since 1750, though the actual number is probably much higher as many species cannot be confirmed extinct. 
What is most alarming, however, is that plant extinction rate is about 500 times greater now than it was before the Industrial Revolution. So moving on to how uh, examples of how climate change and increased CO2 is impacting aquatic species such as sea turtles. Sea turtles already have a very high mortality rate as one, about one in every 1,000 eggs that is laid reaches adulthood due to completely natural factors, natural predators, um, ocean currents, et cetera. As sea levels rise due to thermal expansion of seawater as, as it warms, the melting of ice, and changes in the amount of water stored on land, the uh, more beach habitat where eggs are laid are destroyed. Additionally, what is most interesting about sea turtles is that the gender of the eggs is determined by temperatures. If an egg is incubated below 81.86 degrees Fahrenheit, the hatchling will be male. If they're incubated above around 87 degrees Fahrenheit, the hatchling will be female. With increased temperatures, more female hatchlings are born, which is leading to problems in population dynamics and reproduction. I wanna be a little bit more specific here and give you some examples that pertain specifically to Switzerland. Based on climate change, uh, driven by an increased amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the changes that are most likely to occur are impaired water, soil, and air quality, a rising snow line, particularly in alpine regions, and a greater risk of flooding, along with increased levels of summer droughts. This will obviously impact wildlife populations, particularly those that are endemic, relying on specific climatic conditions, such as the mountain hare. Mountain hares are well adapted to life uh, at high altitude, altitudes. And with a shrinking mountain habitat due to global warming, the species will be forced to move to cooler and higher elevations. A study by the research team led by the Swiss Federal Institute for Forest, Snow and Landscape Research, WSL, investigated the impact of climate change on mountain hare species distribution in the Swiss Alps. So based on just over a thousand mountain hare observations recorded between 1990 and 2013, Researchers modeled the location and the extent of current and future habitat. And this was all based on global warming scenarios from the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Researchers found that above all, rising temperatures during hare's breeding season is what influences the habitat that's available to the species. This is because cold adapted species such as this are much less adept at regulating their body temperatures during these hot summers they must move to cooler climates, which are becoming increasingly limited. The researchers found that ultimately under a medium warming scenario, it is projected that habitat loss for hares will be around 26% compared to 45% in a stronger warming scenario. Again, climate change does not just impact mammalian populations and there is a growing concern over the effect of global warming and how it will impact alpine vegetation. For example, example, experts in the field have suggested that the Purple Mountain Saxifrage could become extinct due to overheating. With global warming, floral species that are indigenous to countries bordering the Mediterranean will be able to thrive in Central Europe due to these warmer and uh, more moist conditions. These plants, which are now going to be invasive, will force native alpine species to flee move up to higher elevations. However, there comes a point where these alpine species will hit a wall. They will have nowhere further that they can go. And even without invasive species, alpine vegetation is also threatened by a dramatic rise in temperature and a lack of rain due to climate change. Now, I know that all can sound very negative, And I find when talking about climate change and the impact that human activities have had on the environment, it's very easy to get into a rut and to only focus on the negative. But what is important is to remember that it isn't too late and change, positive change can happen and it can start right in your own home. We're gonna take some time to discuss ways in which you can reduce your CO2 emissions. And I've narrowed it down here to five different categories that you're gonna see on the screen. Transportation, heating, lights and appliances, food consumption, food waste and clothing choices. And while I'm going through these, maybe start to think about how you can implement these changes in your life. And if you have any other ideas of how to limit your carbon output, if we have time at the end, maybe we can share them or share them in the chat for others to see as well. 
Beginning with transportation, one of the easiest ways to reduce your carbon output is to drive less. Use public transportation when you can, such as the bus or train, ride a bike, or walk if you're just going somewhere close to you, as this can significantly reduce your carbon output. And this next one was interesting, driving efficiently. Brian West, an expert in the Fuel and Engine Research um, Institute from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, said that driving as if you have an egg under your foot, going easy on the gas, easy on the brakes, can actually largely reduce your emissions if it's something that you practice constantly. Regularly servicing your car. Keeping your car more efficient will mean that it will burn less fuel. Carpooling, splitting your emissions between the number of people in the car, as we all know, very important. Finally, flying less. Flying generates a tremendous amount of emissions through the burning of jet fuel. And I know you can't always avoid flying, particularly for people who maybe their careers are based around flights. Um, but even if you can avoid just one flight per year, the emission savings are huge. And if you can't avoid flying, maybe one way to make up for the emissions is to donate to sustainable projects. Sometimes airlines will give you this option to donate part um, to some sort of uh, uh, sustainable project that's helping to reduce emissions, um, particularly in uh, developing countries. If you, they don't offer this option, you can use a third party app such as Atmosphere or TerraPast to calculate your emissions and how much you would donate to offset. In your homes uh, per pertaining to heating lights and appliances, turn down your heat. Less heat means that less energy is used. Keep blinds closed to help regulate temperature. Um, turning off lights and appliances when you're not using them and unplug small appliances from power outlets as appliances continue to use power even when turned off. It's estimated that about 10% of uh, people's electric bill is spent on appliances when they aren't actually being used. Choose a, re a renewable energy source. Some countries allow you to choose your energy supplier. It really depends on, on where you're living. And if you can, pick one that runs on renewable energy, solar, hydro, wind, etc. Uh, replacing old refrigerators. Old refrigerators use an incredible amount of energy. If possible, replace your uh, new one with a more efficient version. Um, finally, uh, seal and insulate homes. Trouble spots such as the attic, windows, and doors can allow heat and cool air to escape, leading you to use much more energy to heat or cool your home than might be necessary. Installing a low flow shower head and toilets to help control the amount of water that you're using. And finally, replacing old thermostats with programmable ones. That way you're able to lower your thermostat when you're sleeping, when you are out of your house for work, when you're traveling, et cetera. Moving to food consumption. Now this is a very interesting topic that I find is talked a lot about in the media um, is the impact that what you eat and how you eat impacts the environment. So the biggest one is to eat less meat. Livestock farming has a very large environmental footprint that contributes to land and water degradation, biodiversity loss, and deforestation. Meat production, if you will, is incredibly inefficient as it takes about 25 kilograms of grain and 15,000 liters of water to produce just one kilogram of beef. By trying to limit your meat intake, even if it's just one day a week, you commit to not consuming any meat products, you can lower your emissions. And this can be done by replacing with some sort of meat alternative or by consuming legumes or grains, both of which can contain high levels of protein. And while it's important to look at what you eat, it is also important to look at where your food is coming from. Trying to consume food, including meat, that comes from local farmers can reduce what's called your food mileage and support, it also helps to support your local economy. This idea in particular is somewhat debated as experts in the field aren't sure how much food mileage impacts the um, global CO2 output. However, I think it is, it's important to try and eat as local and as seasonal as you can. But agriculture isn't going away. So how do we make it more efficient? Agriculture is an incredibly integral part of our economy and infrastructure and has been since the dawn of human civilization. And there have been some recent developments that have shown that the meat industry in particular can be more sustainable. Regenerative agriculture is a very important term here. 
And this describes farming and grazing practices that among other benefits, reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil biodiversity, which results in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. So this can include grazing livestock on grassland, rotating them regularly and feeding them in conjunction with various crops rotated on the farm. Additionally, though this may not pertain specifically to CO2 emissions, farmers can plant wildflowers on the perimeters of their field, uh, particularly those that grow crops to uh, help support local pollinator populations, which, help can in, which in turn can help increase the yield of their crops. So for food waste, Swiss households generate around 1 million tons of food waste each year, most of which will end up in landfill. In landfill, rotting food produces methane, which is another greenhouse gas similar to CO2. However, it's 21 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And it's estimated that about 7% of greenhouse gases produced globally are due to preventable food waste. So how do we fix this? First, take stock. Organize your fridge and check what you have. Make grocery lists before you go shopping to stop yourself from buying things that you don't need. Don't fall for the bulk deal. Although it may seem like a way to save money, if you don't end up eating the food before it goes bad, it is simply waste. Plan your meals and eat your leftovers. Try not to cook for more than the amount of people that might be seated at the table. And if you do, pack up the leftovers and eat it the next day, just to avoid throwing out your food. Freeze. You can extend the life of your food dramatically by freezing it. Think fresh herbs, bread, full meals. You can bring, take, put them in the freezer, take them out when you're ready to eat them. Compost, if you can. Having a compost bin can help divert food from the landfill. And I know this may not be applicable to everyone depending on where you live in the world, depending on what city you're in, you might not have a municipal composting system. Um, but even if you have one in your backyard, you can use the compost to feed plants and help grow a garden if you have one. And finally, skipping the disposable utensils from restaurants. If you're bringing food home, which I'm sure many of us have done over the course of the past year, ask not to have the utensils that often come with takeout. And if you can, wash and reuse the plastic containers that your food comes in. Finally, dressing sustainably. Fast fashion is an incredibly important topic. So fast fashion is, the, is an approach to the design, the creation, and the marketing of clothing fashions that emphasize making fashion trends quickly, cheaply, and readily available to customers. Think of stores such as H&M, Zara, Forever 21. Fast fashion and the fashion industry in general is one of the world's greatest polluters and users of resources. The fashion industry is responsible for about 10% of humanity's carbon emissions, which is more than all international flights and maritime shipping combined. They also are responsible for using large volumes of resources. For example, it takes about 2,700 liters of water to make just one cotton t-shirt and almost 1.3 trillion gallons of water are used each year to dye fabrics with harmful chemicals. Additionally, in most countries where these garments are produced, untreated toxic wastewaters from textile factories are dumped in rivers, and these waters can contain toxic substances such as lead, mercury, and arsenic. You can also look at the impact that the growth of cotton has on the environment. We're seeing high levels of soil erosion and degradation that we haven't seen before, as well as pollution of local water sources from application of fertilizers and pesticides. Furthermore, Brands use synthetic fibers like polyester, nylon, and acrylic, which take hundreds of years to biodegrade. Every time we wash a synthetic garment, about 1,900 individual microfibers are released into the water, making their way into the oceans. Scientists have discovered that small aquatic organisms ingest microfibers, which are then eaten by fish, which then introduces the plastic into our food chain. In today's society, Western countries purchase an average of 40% more clothing than they did in 2000. So in order to combat this, I suggest trying to use, uh, support brands that are committed to sustainably sourced materials and use their profits to support the communities from which they get their materials from. Even better, try and use or buy used clothing from thrift stores 
or some newer online websites that I'm seeing that specialize in selling used clothing online, such as ThreadUp. So you might be wondering how your actions can actually help impact the world, given the scale of the problems that we are facing. Well, you can, and this is based on an idea called the ripple effect. Human beings are highly, highly social species. I'm sure you can think of the last time you started a new TV show or listened to a new song because someone in your social circle recommended it to you. There is a significant impact when just one person deviates from the norm, according to psychological studies. Studies tell us that even if just one person, such as yourself, starts to act sustainably, others in your immediate circle will follow suit. You may not understand how you can influence those around you, but by being the change that you wish to see in the world, you're helping to build momentum against climate change. And I found this quote by Dr. Michael Mataro from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I thought it was very fitting. And he says, an individual can help the global effort to tackle climate change, the climate change dilemma by being part of the collective solution, making bold decisions and sacrifices and sharing their personal decisions with the community as a positive influence. Now, going back kind of what we talked about at the beginning, while the drivers of climate change and increased CO2 output are, you know, largely, um, they come from these big conglomerates and they come from uh, the burning of fossil fuels. And it ultimately relies on decreasing our reliance on conventional energy sources, such as fossil fuels and strict changes in public policy. However, the changes you make and what you ask of those around you can help us to build a better future. Thank you.